So today we're going to look at Martin Luther King Jr. And I'm going to go ahead and start because it's after now nine o'clock. And um, I, I thought I would begin with the, with the collect, which we now have for the feast of St. Of, of Martin Luther King Jr. in our, uh, now it's called, um, it's not holy men and holy women anymore. It's, what is it now, Are we Great cloud of witnesses. Right, where we got the name of our class. Okay, so I'd like to offer this prayer as we consider Martin Luther King Jr. today. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the hand of Moses, your servant, you led your people out of slavery and made them free at last. Grant that your church, following the example of your prophet Martin Luther King Jr., may resist oppression in the name of your love and may secure for all your children the blessed liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Can you hear me okay, everybody? Um, thanks to Owen and the, the miracle of technology, we're going to look at two letters today, but not right now. I thought I would do some contextual things first. And I thought it's always good to look at a person as, with an ex expansive life and biography as Martin Luther King Jr. is to not take in the full expanse of his biography. That's just too much. So I thought we would look at one year in his life, particularly the spring of 1963 and what is arguably the most important thing he ever wrote. Of course, the most important thing he ever spoke was his speech at the Lincoln Memorial that same year in August of 1963. But many people who study his life much more than me um, consider that the letter that we'll look at in a little bit, the letter from the Birmingham jail is the most important, impactful thing that he ever wrote. Um, in terms of a, a treatise, if you might, if you, if you will. Um, so a lot of you know a lot about Martin Luther King Jr. So I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail of his biography, except to touch on a number of points. Um, but I want to go back before his life, before his biography, to say what's the spiritual context of a person like Martin Luther King Jr.? Why is it that he lives into what we might call a hero or a model for us, if you will, of the Christian life? And um, it would have to do with his um, spiritual tradition. Because Martin Luther King Jr., while he was a great public figure in US history, he was primarily a spiritual leader and was never, never shy about his um, spiritual tradition. Um, so going back to scripture um, and to his own context, we would say that um, the African-American church, um, especially in the United States and in the South, um, was born out of the prophetic tradition. Um, so Martin Luther King Jr. would have grown up listening to his father, who was also a pastor and a preacher, Daddy King, as he's always called, um, preached Sunday by Sunday by Sunday out of the prophetic tradition. So it's not just the mimicking that Martin Luther King would have had from his father. It's also the biblical tradition he would have heard Sunday after Sunday. The five great prophets that his father concentrated on, by the way, if you look at all of the sermons, I've looked at a lot of them, of Daddy King's sermons, um, almost all of them <laughs> came out of five uh, prophetic traditions, uh, starting with Elijah, the great prophet of Israel's history. Remember, Jesus, when he was transfigured, was seen to be with Elijah and Moses, the, the great prophet and the great lawgiver, and then Jesus, the three of them were transfigured 
um, in front of the disciples. So Elijah tradition is huge in um, Daddy King's tradition. Also Isaiah. Uh, most of us think there were three periods of Isaiah, first, second, and third before, during, and after the Babylonian exile. And he preached from all three, but primarily from the second and the third. That is, what is it like to be in exile in Babylon? That's from chapter 40 through chapter 55, by the way, of Isaiah. And then 55 through 66, which is third Isaiah, is about the return um, after the exile into um, the return back into the promised land. Um, so he preached from Isaiah a lot, Jeremiah also. And then of course, Micah and Amos, those five prophets really are the spiritual underpinnings of um, Martin Luther King Jr. But then strangely, as he began uh, uh, to really come into his own, into his adulthood and his own academic study, and he got on to Gandhi. What he realized is when he started reading Gandhi, he was also reading about his own tradition and the person of Jesus. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as Gandhi was looking at nonviolent resistance and cultivating it in, in direct action, we might call it, Martin Luther King Jr. began to not only see some real benefits of nonviolent resistance um, and direct action, but he also saw the person of Jesus right in the middle of all this. And what did he see from Jesus in the middle was the Sermon on the Mount. The same thing that Bonhoeffer found when he was into his own nonviolent resistance against Nazism. You know, Gandhi once said, you know, I'd be, a, I'd be a Christian if it weren't for the Christians. You know, he was quite taken, Gandhi was, by the person of Jesus. Quite taken by the person of Jesus. But he, he was not quite taken by then this body of people who uh, were seeking to follow Jesus. <laughs> so... Um, and what was he taken by? He was taken by the same thing that Martin Luther King Jr. was taken by, and that is the Sermon on the Mount. Um, it's there, of course, that uh, Martin Luther King began to meld the prophetic tradition of his upbringing and his father's own preaching with then his own baptism of being a Christian and being a follower of Jesus. And... Um, he was able to begin to put those two together then. And in the middle of that is uh, the strong theme in both Old and New Testament of the suffering servant. Isaiah was the primary prophet to talk about that, but then Jesus, of course, lived it, the suffering servant of Jesus's um, act, direct action of crucifixion, and then um, Christians believed in resurrection. So the passion of Christ became central also to Martin Luther King Jr., how one person would offer oneself in love for the sake and the benefit of not only the neighbor, uh, but in Jesus's case, for the stranger and, yea, even for the enemy, the one who would send you to the cross, he, he loved equally. That's a, that's a remarkable trait, of course, of Jesus. Um, and one that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. picked up, of course, that Jesus took on the brutality of crucifixion as he was calling the black community, and especially in the South, to take on the whipping and the fire hoses and the um, ostracization, uh, the, um, the, the, the pushback they were receiving. Um, so that's a, that's a little bit of the, you know, there's, there's a whole lot more to it, but we don't have enough time today to go too much into it. But I, let me stop and say, that's the, that's the largest contextual piece um, that I want to bring to why it is that Martin Luther King became who he was and why he was able to endure what he endured. Um, questions or comments about that tradition?
What's interesting about the letters that we're going to begin to look at is that um, <laughs> um, Martin Luther King was beginning to be considered by, Bur by people in Birmingham as an outsider. Well, <laughs> contraire, he was... <laughs> He was the senior pastor of the largest black Baptist church in Montgomery, right down the road. It would be almost like if people in Tampa um, said, uh, if they were considered by Jackson Villians as an outsider, you know, you, if you just live down the road, you kind of know who each other is. So the fact that they considered him an outsider was so funny because he grew up in the deep South. His father, his father was a well-known Baptist preacher all over the South, and how these white ministers could con consider him as an outside agitator is just so funny, uh, because he was, he was right from that area. Yes, Elizabeth. I can't hear you, Elizabeth. You're, you're muted. Sorry, sorry. Um, I had the privilege of going to the uh, MLK library at Boston University when my, yeah. my child was there. Um, yeah. Wasn't there, when, in answer to your question, why he became who he was, wasn't there a professor at, uh, at BU who was very, very uh, important in his development? Yeah, there are several professors who became important to him, and I'll touch on that in a minute, but both at Crozier theological seminary where he got his master's in divinity and then at BU where he got his PhD there were several professors who became important the figure who became important to him though was Crozier um, had joined hands with Colgate Rochester divinity school by then and then later one of our own seminaries joined hands with them this was after Martin Luther King though that was um, uh, Bexley Hall Bexley Hall used to be in Ohio. That was our divinity school. And then it, it needed to join hands with something larger. So it became Colgate, Rochester, Crozier, Bexley Hall by the time the 70s rolled around. But in King's period, it was Colgate, Rochester, and Crozier. And the important part of the Colgate, Rochester part was that they had Walter Rauschenbusch was a famous preacher and theologian and they had all of his papers because he taught at Colgate Rochester Divinity School and he was the godfather of the social gospel movement in the United States from about 1890 until about 1925 there was what was called the social gospel movement and it was a whole uh, movement in the urban north that said a lot of people are suffering from poverty in the urban North, child labor laws, women were being um, put down, et cetera, just on and on. Well, they took on these major social challenges, um, believing that the kingdom of God was to be ushered in now and not just some future promise. Walter Rauschenbusch became very important to Martin Luther King Jr. then. And then, yes, you're right. At BU, a couple professors, especially one who taught on Reinhold Niebuhr, you know, wasn't just Gandhi or Dietrich Bonhoeffer or the prophetic tradition that became important, but Reinhold Niebuhr became important to, uh, to uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s thinking. You may know this is a little trivia. Um, Time magazine has only had three religious figures as the as the person of the year in their whole history of Time magazine. Guess who the three um, were? Anybody want to venture a guess? One of them was Billy Graham. And one of them was C.S. Lewis. And one of them was Reinhold Niebuhr. The three of them are the only religious figures that Time Magazine has ever set up. Now, they, they should have included a whole lot of other people, like Mother Teresa, excuse me. Um, you know, where are the women also? But um, I don't think they started having women until maybe the 80s as Time 
person of the year. They used to call it the man of the year, remember? <laughs> now it's called person of the year. But um, So Reinhold Niebuhr uh, became important to King, and that was through the BU professors. Let me go over his biography just to, just to remind all of us. He was born in 29 in Atlanta. Um, as a boy, he witnessed, like a lot of um, African Americans, a lot of violence and hatred, a lot. At 15, he was admitted to Morehouse College in Atlanta. At 15, obviously, he was bright. He used to say, I have my mother's private faith, and I have my father's public faith. That's important to remember that he had a great reservoir of, of interior spirituality, which he, he said was his mother's. And then he had a great public ministry, of course, and he said that was his father's. So uh, he acknowledged that he was influenced by both of his parents. After graduating at 19 from Morehouse, Morehouse College, he attended Crozier Theological Seminary and finished his master's in divinity at 23. Along the way, you know, Baptists don't wait till you have your theological degree to ordain you. So this Baptist church ordained him at 19. As soon as he finished Morehouse College, he was ordained a pastor. He went directly from Crozier to Boston University, <clears throat> received his PhD at 26. So like, um, a little bit like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who got his PhD at 23, <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to imagine these really smart people who finish all these doctorate degrees before they're hardly even in their 20s. As I mentioned at BU, especially at BU, he began to study the nonviolent resistance movement of Gandhi. In 1953, he married Coretta Scott, who, of course, became Coretta Scott King, and he became the pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery in 1954. In 1955, a year later, he became the head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, um, and he did. He was the head of that until 63, so for eight years, he was the head of the most important um, boycott movement in the South, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. They were the leader of almost every boycott that happened in the South, including, I might add, places in Florida. Um, my mother was born about 40 minutes north of Delan, Florida, which is where Stetson University is. She went to Stetson. She was born on a farm about 40 minutes north of there in eastern Marion County. And uh, there was a boycott by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in Deland, Florida, <clears throat> and also in, in St. Augustine, where Martin Luther King Jr. spoke, by the way. I think in 1964 or 65, you'd have to check my dates, but he did speak publicly in St. Augustine, and there was a boycott there. I don't think there was one in Jacksonville, but you can test me on that, but there were a number of them in Georgia, of course. <clears throat> and um, of course, in 63, he gave his most important speech, which is at the Lincoln Memorial. <clears throat> um, so that's a little bit of the early biography. Of course, a lot happened after 63. In 1968, by the way, the last sermon he ever gave before he was assassinated was at the national, our national cathedral in 1968. So I'm proud to say that our own cathedral um, invited him to be a, the Sunday morning preacher at 11 o'clock in 1968. 
where he preached, by the way, against the Vietnam War. He did not preach mostly that day about racism, although it was always on his mind. He mainly preached against the Vietnam War, which is very interesting that that was also part of his legacy. Let me go back, though, and put <clears throat> this letter that he wrote in 1963 into context. <clears throat> Remember in history, 1857, 1857 was the Dred Scott decision. That decision said that it was up to some of the new states, Missouri being one of them, I think I don't know if Iowa was one, but I know Missouri was one and Oklahoma, the new states could become slave states. They allowed the expansion of slavery by the new states taking on slavery. That was part of the Dred Scott decision. And the, the downside of that for those trying to um, get rid of slavery was that it actually expanded slavery of course, you know the dates of the Civil War. The Emancipation Proclamation was in 1863. Some people think it was at the end of the Civil War, but it was right in the middle. Um, how Abraham Lincoln was able to pull that off was quite amazing. Um, you know, he barely got the votes, though. I think by one or two votes, he, the, um, that proclamation was passed. The 13th Amendment, of course, to the Constitution was 1865 at the end of the Civil War. Reconstruction is considered from 1865 to 1890, where in Florida and other Southern states, there were actually some Blacks who were elected to state and federal office. Only until 1890, though, when Jim Crow laws began to emerge, and they were a prominent part of the South's culture until at least um, the 19, early 1960s. So for some 70 years, Jim Crow laws really um, were part of the challenge of Martin Luther King Jr. Most people think the civil rights movement started in 1954. There's debates about when it started, but most people pin it um, on 1954. Um, the, the Birmingham desegregation resistance started in 62, but then came into full flourish beginning in January of 1963. The boycotts started in January of 63. And that spring, Martin Luther King Jr. and, and um, Ralph Abernathy were the two leaders of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference that went to Birmingham to lead them the newest boycott. They were arrested, guess on what day? <laughs> Good Friday. They were arrested on Good Friday, April 12th, 1963. And while, while he was in prison, <clears throat> eight prominent... <clears throat> excuse me, eight prominent white clergymen. They were all men. One of them was a Jewish rabbi and the other seven were Christian. One of whom was the Episcopal Bishop of Alabama. Two of whom were the Roman Catholic bishops of two different dioceses in Alabama. Two of them were two Methodist bishops of the of the two main Methodist conferences in Alabama. And one of them was the senior pastor of, of, the, of the First Baptist Church of Birmingham. Those were the eight. And they wrote a letter to the editor, to the Birmingham newspaper. Um, and within the letter, they used the words to Martin Luther King Jr. that his movement that winter and spring was unwise and untimely. Well, it was the editors of the newspaper that decided that they would put that title at the heading of the letter that they printed in the Sunday. That was then Easter Sunday edition of um, the Birmingham paper. It's, it's um, 
I don't know if it was by accident or God's providence that Good Friday and Easter were the days when all this appeared or happened, but um, so be it. So the letter has always been called unwise and untimely, but the ministers did not put that title on their letter. They just wrote simply to the citizens of Birmingham. And um, so the famous letter from the ministers, unwise and untimely, um, was fairly short. And Owen has it. And if you could put that up for a minute, Owen, I'm going to talk while it's up, and then I want to I want to pause before I get to his response. You can see letter to Martin Luther King, April twelfth, nineteen sixty three. Um, without reading the letter, you don't need me to do that. They make four arguments in the letter against King and Abernathy and their, their resistance, their boycott that's happening. The first argument they make is that King and his group, his cohort are quote, outsiders and they shouldn't be the leader of a boycott in Birmingham. That should be left up to local people. As they call them, they're, they're local Negroes. Isn't that interesting that white people, back, maybe white people still today, but it's almost like it was there, like it's our Negroes um, in Birmingham should be the only ones leading anything around here that you are and your group or outsiders, they didn't use the word agitators, but they didn't have to. That was already a motto that was used around um, the South a lot is outside agitators. But they argue against King doing this because he's an outsider. The second thing they argue in the letter is that he and his company, his cohort, should negotiate, that's the word they use, quote, negotiate, rather than, quote, demonstrate. They believe that dem demonstrations are causing um, tensions, they use the word tension in the letter, crisis, and in some cases, violence. It's not coming from King and his cohort, the violence, but they believe that they need to just negotiate. That's the word they use. The third argument that they use in the letter is King and his cohort, th their direct actions are, quote, untimely. That is, they need to go slower. That it's not the right time. And then the fourth argument is there's no justification in their direct action for breaking local ordinances, or they would call it local laws um, about the right to demonstrate, where they can demonstrate, et cetera. Of course, um, so those are the four arguments that they make in the letter. To conclude the letter, um, uh, we further strongly urge our own Negro community to withdraw support from King and his cohort um, and to work peacefully for a better Birmingham. <laughs> um, and then they appeal finally for what they call common sense. So let me, let me stop. Those are the four arguments that were made um, in the letter from the eight clerk, white men, clergymen. Remember, one was a Jewish rabbi, so they're not all Christians. But he was, by the way, the rabbi of the largest um, temple or synagogue downtown Birmingham. There they're, they're listed. Rabbi um, Milton Grafman. Temple Emmanuel, Birmingham. Our bishop, by the way, is George Murray, um, who actually, to be fair to George Murray, later became quite a hero of civil rights. He was just coming in. You can see Bishop Coadjutor. It's like, welcome to Episcopal uh, life there, Bishop. You're just becoming the bishop, and here we have an easy job for you. We want you to be part of writing to Martin Luther King Jr., who's in prison. Um, so 
Anyway, uh, let me stop before we get into King's um, response. Any, any uh, discussion or comments? Okay. I, say, I think it's interesting that um, when they talk about the violence, they're talking about their own violence. There was white people committing the violence. Um, and instead of yeah. taking responsibility for that, they put the responsibility on the victims of the violence. Yeah, Megan, you're right. There's, there's, not, a whole, there's not much mirror, <laughs> mirror looking, we might call it in this letter. It's a lot of pointing and accusation and um, projection, we might say. Um, you know, a lot of us have learned along in our own life journey that um, we've all been caught with projection, something that's going on in our own heart. And we project that emotion or that trouble or that challenge onto somebody else in some way. That is, they're the ones who are causing it or it's their challenge. Um, uh, and rather than looking in the mirror, there's also a, a very, I mean, reading this now almost 60 years later, imagine if this was 57 years ago, so almost 60 years ago, when we read it now, it, it, it does feel real old. Um, and in a way, thankfully, it feels old. Uh, but some I still hear stuff from the church today. I mean, this could have some, been written. This right. could have been written now. <laughs> yeah. Some things all, from clergy now. Um, yeah, so some things feel also strangely um, current. <laughs> yeah, there's also some disturbing traits that, that it feels current. Um, okay, so then uh, let me have Aween put the, uh, his response up. The, it's called The Letter from the Birmingham Jail. As she's working on that, let me let you know that he didn't have any paper, um, any regular writing paper with him in jail. And so they let him have a newspaper. And they also, he also had toilet paper in his prison cell. So he wrote about half of this letter on ripped up newspaper. And he wrote half of it on toilet paper. And he, he didn't smuggle it out. It wasn't so much like Bonhoeffer smuggling out the letters, the letters from the Tegel prison in 1943 in Germany, but it, it has a little bit of that um, same symbolism that is, it was all tattered and then all kinds of pieces and numbered in all kinds of ways. And he got this out to a friend who was then able to put all this together so that he could put it in the letter form. Can you, you all that? see it? Can you see you got it? That away? No, it's not up yet. Really? It's still the um, letter from clergy. Huh. It's on my screen. I'm not sure. Let's see. Huh. Well, let me try it again. Can you see this? No. It's on my screen, but it's to the left of the other letter, which remains up. All right, I'm sorry. Now I'm, um, how about now? It's not the main one. She's right, it's on the left. It's real small on the left, but you could touch your screen and make it larger if you well, it's yeah. full size on mine, so I'm not sure um, what the, oh dear. Michael, can you help me with this? I'm not sure if this will completely work, but you might try stop sharing your screen, click on the letter, <laughs> that page, and then share your screen again. Thank you. There you go. All right, good. Perfect. Okay, so you can see on um, April the 16th, then the letter was sent to him on the tw dated the 12th. And now four days later, it's now in letter form. But to remem remember, 
he was writing profusely this fairly lengthy response and on pieces of toilet paper, for heaven's sake. And uh, they finally were able to put it all together and, and edit it. He then later, by the way, um, after he got out of jail, he then took the letter that he didn't think was refined enough and then put it in a, this more refined uh, condition. Like any of us, he, you know, he wanted to clean it up a little bit because it, it was in pretty rough shape. Okay, so again, without, re without reading the letter to you, you don't need me to do that. Um, I wanna touch on some points that he makes in the letter. Um, first, it's to be noted that he's, he receives this fairly um, abrupt and finger-pointing letter from these white clergymen and um, he responds with a very um, moderated and moderating tone um, where he's very patient and very calm um, and, and very respectful and very professional. He learned his lessons well about teaching people about non-resistance and um, a non-violent resistance that is. And, um, so first he neutralizes the clergyman's arguments. He, he talks first about the movement is not by outside agitators, that he's one of them. And he even argues, even if I wasn't from this area as a Christian and as a person of faith and as a, as a concerned citizen, um, there's injustice in Birmingham, so therefore he should care about it anyway. That's where he uses his famous line, though. This is the first time he ever wrote this line, but it's been attributed to him in a lot of other places, and that is, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny, Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. That's now a famous line of Martin Luther King Jr. And he wrote it from prison for heaven's sake on toilet paper. Um, so um, that's in the letter. So injustice is everyone's issue, not just for people who are in Birmingham. He, um, he knows that there's, um, that there's three types of Southern white people, at least three types. One is an extreme segregationist. He doesn't see these guys in that category at all. The other is the activist against segregation. He doesn't see them in that category either. There's a middle a middle portion though that's called, he called them white moderation. He considers that the clergymen are in that category. And so he engages their moderate, the moderate conscience in the letter. So he understands who they are. And that's a very important matter in the letter. He doesn't, um, he doesn't miss the mark, in other words, in understanding who they are. <clears throat> um, he confronts subtly mere self-interest in the letter. And um, that's a very, uh, very important matter. It's, he doesn't do it directly, it's indirect. And that's always interest. It's always a sign of a good sermon, by the way, when it confronts just merely my self-interest. We're to love our neighbor and not just ourself, in other words. He's also arguing in the letter that the demonstrations and the boycotts are confronting conditions and not people, not groups. He's not, they're not picking on people, they're picking on conditions. 
the structures of racism, in other words. And we hear that now, you know, after George Floyd's terrible murder um, in Minneapolis, the, the voice was strong again to say, we need to deal with the structures of racism, not just the people who spout it. So King is arguing that they're dealing with the structures and the conditions that cause for segregation and racism. He also is, is defending nonviolent direct action as a much more effective means for justice and not mere negotiations. He's seen what negotiation does. It, it stalls in the mud and doesn't go anywhere. He's seen it all the way from 1954 to now 1963. So for eight years, he's seen, he's heard and seen this thing about, let's just negotiate, but that doesn't ever go anywhere, according to King. So nonviolent direct action is what they're into now. So he's arguing for it in this response. He also argues in the letter that real freedom is rarely given by oppressors. but is sought by the oppressed. He also addresses their argument about being unt about uh, this movement being untimely. He argues in the letter, of course, that African-American patience has existed for over 200 years. <laughs> and that guess what? Um, they're, that's, they're, that's, they're done, they've had enough. 200 years of waiting is enough. And now this is not untimely. It is, it is about time, in other words, that they get after this. They also are, he also argues in the letter, civil disobedience um, far outweighed the abject breaking of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. In other words, if a law is unjust, according to the core values of the United States, then um, a group of people has every right to resist it and, and, and actually break it if it's an unjust law and is not consistent with the core values of the United States. So they don't see, he doesn't see it as breaking the law. He actually sees it as resisting an unjust law or civil disobedience. He says in the letter, we must make a distinction between just and unjust laws. He, he has an argument in there about what is just and what is unjust. He next argues that the, that the movement that is the civil rights movement is disappointed with what, what he calls white moderates. And I quote, putting order and peace, their version of peace above justice. Of course, the ministers are arguing about law and order and King is arguing for justice. That sounds current, doesn't it? There's people in our country who are now saying we need to have law and order and others who are saying we need justice. That, that language is being used now in 2020. He also argues in the letter, yeah. How many of y'all were in any of the uh, riots that took place back there, back then, because I remember them well here in Jacksonville. Well, I was only <laughs> I was only eight in 1963, so I I wasn't part of. Oh, well, um, I was already a mother, a wife, and a mother of two. Yeah. Um, when this happened. <laughs> 
And the first thing, they did have very, um, the sit-ins and the counters. And I remember one downtown at, um, where the federal building is now was a uh, dime store in Penny's and the dime store had a counter for eating. And that one was very mild. I mean, it was just like it should have been according to um, King and what he taught. But then the riot as the riots are now got very bad. They had to close 95. The riots were over near the Gator Bowl. They tore up the entire area, which was where they lived. It made no sense to any of us. We could not understand if they wanted to have demonstrations and riots, why would they do it against the, the very buildings and stuff that was their own? And um, Anyway, it took a while before they calmed down. That was like 63, 64, somewhere along in there. I started college as an adult with three children. By the time I started in 66, we had had a third child. And it was my first experience of being with uh, Blacks. And that's absolutely no problem, none. We were all in the same places every day because we were nurses, to be nurses. So you don't, for most of your nursing classes, it's a class that goes through together. And absolutely no problem. We accepted it. And so a lot of what I've always heard was not necessarily what exactly happened. Yes. Well, you know, even in even in the early '60s, um, there be, became um, conflict within the African American community about whether non peaceful resistance was actually going to work, and that's when, uh, of course, Malcolm X began to split from Martin Luther King Jr. And on into the middle '60s, we know that there were several different views in the Black community about what could what could answer the issues of um, racism and segregation. And one of them was not, was, was um, not nonviolent resistance. It was, um, so King had uh, challenges within his own community, but in 63, uh, the movement was basically holding together on the, on nonviolent resistance. I only have five minutes left, so let me um, let me go to the letters impact. Well, there was not no impact for a month <laughs> um, after the letter hit and was known to people. Nothing happened, but in May, um, demonstrations and Bull Connor's fire hoses then hit the news. So one month later is when the fire hoses happened. In June of that year, Kennedy used a portion of King's letter in a speech. And then it became known that he had written this letter to the white clergyman. In June, the same month of that year, the Christian Century Magazine, against a lot of pressure, I might add, printed the entire letter in their magazine, and then it was known to the world. Until then, you know, we didn't, we didn't have all the communication we have now. Uh, the, large, uh, the, the large population did not know of the letter. So in June, the whole letter hit and became quite um, the stir. And um, by August, there was a national outcry against what was called mere moderation. And then in August of the same year, King delivered his famous, I have a dream speech. Um, so the letter had a, within a matter of months, a huge impact on, um, on the movement. And of course, we know from 63 on, um, uh, there, was, there, was a, there was a lot of movement. 
that is in 64, 65, where the Voting Rights Act and the, and the um, 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 that um, Lyndon Johnson signed. Um, well, I wanted to reintroduce ourselves to this pe period in our history, to King and to his courage. Um, um, no, no hero or heroine is, is uh, without blemish. Um, King had his own, um, but um, uh, by and large, his biography is full of courage and faith, and um, we know, now know him as an American hero. Um, I think this letter, though, uh, was right in the middle of, of why um, he's considered um, one of our heroes. Um, it's now uh, eight minutes till 10. I think Owen is hoping that we finish these about now so that you can pivot and uh, move over to your in your virtual life uh, over to the 10 o'clock service. If you're driving to the cathedral, hurry up, leave the virtual now <laughs> and get going for the in-person worship. Um, who's next, Owen? Next week, we have Michael Corrigan, who is going to speak about um, Mary Bethune Cookman. Oh, good. And, um, though she is not in the official book, Great Cloud of Witnesses, she is one of our um, saints among us here in Florida and, and sort of the beginning of what we're hoping to do to highlight more of those people. I'd like to just say one thing, Bob, um, the timing again is just incredible for, for your presentation on Martin Luther King. I am not sure, I don't know who will win the election on Tuesday, but I do know that my work in um, sacred ground and pursuing the beloved community will continue to be the same. Um, and, and this is a perfect example of why. The fact that what Martin Luther King said in 63 is still relevant today. And I've asked Megan if she would mention just a little bit about our sacred ground program because I think she suggested this is a good time to share about it. Good. Um, thank you, Aline. Um, First, if any of you haven't read the entire letter, I highly suggest it. And one of the beautiful things about Sacred Ground is that we spend 10 sessions deeply listening to voices that have been intentionally left out of our history. Um, and we gain this perspective. And also, you know, we started this conversation kind of with a little bit of politicking. Um, I just wanna say that <laughs> um, neither party right now can claim any moral high ground, really and truly. Um, we all have miles and miles and miles to go before any of us can do that. Um, so that being said, sacred ground truly is sacred in that we hear the stories, we talk about them, we talk about our own experiences, um, and that it's apolitical because it transcends politics, um, because it talks about justice and it is biblical. Um, so any of you who would like to participate, I highly suggest you get a hold of Oween. Um, we've got groups going on now, but we will have more groups starting later. Um, and it's a wonderful process. So um, it's astonishing actually, what we have been learning and I'm doing it now for the second time and I just keep learning more and more. And it's just opening my heart in ways I could have never imagined. So, um, which truly that's the body of Christ, right? That's what we're looking for is the kingdom of God here and now in the body of Christ. And it's that deep listening to stories that allows that transformation. So. Thank you, Megan. Linda Linda is also a facilitator along with me. Do you have anything to add? Okay. Thank you, Bob. I know you have to go. Sure. Thank you so much, sure. Michael. We look forward to hearing from you next week. Blessings, everybody. Blessings. Thank you. Pray, pray for our country this week. That's Thank right. You.